Good morning. Um, I'm very excited um, to be moderating the STEM panel. I'm Nicole Willett. I'm the education director for the Mars Society. Um, I am an educator. I am um, a, a full-time astronomy instructor. And I am very happy and pleased to introduce our panelists. I will be giving a very short introduction, and then each of them will take a few minutes to give you their story, and then we will um, proceed to questions. And today, I'll try to leave a little time at the end for the audience to ask questions. And first, we, I, it's my pleasure to introduce Miss Alyssa Carson. Um, ever since she was a little girl, she had her heart set on the stars. At three years old, she told her father, Daddy, I want to be an astronaut and one of the first people on Mars. And Alyssa, if you would. Uh, yeah, so at three years old is when I, is it working? Mic, is the mic working? No. Try, there you go. Okay, so yeah, ever since I was three years old, I always had an interest in space and for Mars. And it was always a subject that I knew I wanted to do with my life in the future. And I knew it was something that I wanted to do when I grew up and what I wanted to make a career out of. So after that, I started looking up and researching more about Mars and anything that me as a little three or five year old can look up about space and about the planet of Mars. And after that, I started going to different programs like Space Camp in Huntsville, Alabama. And I went there when I was seven and that's what first really got me, just showed me everything that is involved with space travel and what has been going on in as far as space history and future space exploration. And from there, I've been doing whatever I could to continue my dream of wanting to become an astronaut, eventually go to Mars. And as I've gotten older, I've learned a little bit more about the importance of going to Mars and the different things that it will bring back to Earth and what kind of the benefits it gives here on Earth. And so a little bit about what I'm doing now as far as kind of preparing for the trip. Uh, the next big thing that I'm doing is Possum Academy, which is next week actually, and there I'll start training and doing things such as uh, the zero gravity plane, hypoxia, more about spacesuits, and after that I'll be certified to go to space, which is really exciting. And um, especially, you know, for only being 15 now, it's very exciting for me. And also just being here and hearing other people talk about um, kind of their part in the Mars mission and them talking about their kind of specialty and what they've been working on, how each person here kind of gives something of benefit to eventually fulfill the Mars mission. It's very exciting to hear all the different stories and be here, kind of be a part of it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Alyssa. Next up, we have Jennifer Mandel. She is the director of STEM programs for Lockheed Martin. In this capacity, she is responsible for leading the corporation's STEM philanthropic giving and employee volunteerism. And um, Ms. Mandel, please. Um, well, thank you uh, for having uh, me here today. And I know you heard from one of my uh, very smart colleagues yesterday um, who's working on the Mars Base Camp. So hopefully all of you know that Lockheed Martin has played a role in all of 20 uh, NASA's missions to Mars, and, and certainly we are um, working on the Orion program um, as we speak. But as a company, we really realize that you know we need to inspire um, and engage more Alyssa's. Um, we need to start with children. Um, you know, not everyone certainly sees the spark at age three. Um, but what we do is we have a uh, fairly robust uh, STEM program uh, that we created specifically around space exploration, and it's called Generation Beyond. Um, we launched it um, in April at the uh, USA Science and Engineering Festival here in D.C. Um, and, and what it is, it's uh, an all-encompassing curriculum uh, for, for, K for middle school students. Um, right now, we built it with Discovery Education. It's online. It's free. Um, we also, um, adding to that, um, we are doing a uh, student video challenge, so challenging students to build um, what their version of a habitation module to Mars would look like. Um, and then um, next week, in fact, we're letting um, students and, and really anyone, all of you are invited, for a virtual field trip inside our, uh, our space headquarters, which is outside of Denver. 
Um, and you know, just just really opening the doors, um, showing you know, kind of as a as a obviously a contractor to NASA, but what is Lockheed Martin doing um, to you know get a man to Mars? Um, so we're really excited about the program. Thrilled to be here today, and and hopefully talk a little bit more about it. Thank you. And Bob Barboza has a very long bio, so I will let him <laughs> complete that. But briefly, he has a lot of experience with STEM. Um, Bob is a STEM advocate and founder of Kids Talk Radio, which you've probably heard of. So Bob, you have the floor. Hello, everyone. I am Bob Barboza, and I'm really thrilled to be here. Uh, I got the Mars bug 100% when I toured SpaceX. Uh, one of my students was uh, working there, and he said uh, to myself and another professor, would you like to come for a tour of SpaceX? And I said, oh, I, I, we almost ran there without taking the car. <laughs> so we went to the front door, and we had to show our driver's license to prove that we were US citizens. And once that was over, uh, we went through the front door, and it was the most thrilling thing of my life. I said, oh my God, I would work here and pay these people to work here. <laughs> the first thing I saw was three gigantic rockets in the, in the hallway, and then a, a huge picture of Earth, and then a huge picture of Mars. Mars terraformed. And I said, sign me up. I found out where the Mars Society was, and here I am, I've prepared a special little video because my people do not trust me to talk to you. I get too <laughs> excited and get off topic. So uh, I'm going to fulfill their wish, show you the video, and answer questions at the end. Thank you for letting me be in your presence. Do you have the Bob Barboza video? If the video doesn't work, I have to go to plan B and plan <laughs> C. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> there is a God. <laughs> what would be your actual wish for the Long Beach Unified School District? One of the things that I would love is to work with every one of your science. There isn't a God. <laughs> a team to get our kids really, really excited about learning. Greetings, everyone. My name is Bob Barboza, and welcome to the Barboza Space Center. And welcome to the robotics department of the Barboza Space Center. This is one of the most exciting departments. I happen to have in front of me a humanoid robot. This is the robot that I'll take with me to the planet Mars. While I'm asleep, he'll run the spaceship. If I come up with any medical problems along the way, as long as I'm wearing my Apple Watch and I have my Apple phone in my pocket, this guy will actually capture my medical information and get me the help I need. But right now, Good, I needed him to give me a little signal because I know he speaks 12 foreign languages and I will be speaking English today. Honestly, he'll run the spaceship, technical information, and get me the help I need. But right now, good, I needed him to give me a little signal because I know he speaks 12 foreign languages and I will be speaking English today. And what I want to do is have him get up. Okay, Mr. Now, I'm glad you're looking for me because I'm right here. I've had a wonderful career in public education. I had a chance to teach for the Paramount Unified School District. And then I had the opportunity to go ahead and work on a special project called the XQ Super School Project. And that was a special program 
that was put together by Mrs. Jobs and her team. And we were basically asked to put together our own team to help rethink the American high school. Because we're prototyping all the time, kids get an opportunity to do and to use what we call STEAM++, science, technology, engineering, visual and performing arts, mathematics, computer languages, and foreign languages. We're going to work with people from different locations around the world. We're in the business of training junior astronauts, junior scientists, and junior engineers. Now, we take uh, visual and performing arts really seriously. And we have Kids Talk Radio Science for our students to do something special that we call STEM Stories. We're trying to train our students to play the music and sound effects behind a STEM story. Here's how it works. If I was a classical musician and I had to play the timpani, I would need a huge van to carry everything around. But if I have electronic timpani, I could represent the orchestra like this. In the beginning, we were called the All Teachers Occupied Mars Band because they were just teachers. But now we're going to add different wind controllers and we're going to add different laser instruments until we get a full orchestra. And our purpose is to play the music and sound effects behind STEM story. So when you see all of these musical instruments, I want you to think of being in a physics class. And all kinds of different devices that have to do with the physics of sound. Because I program these laser beams to be different instruments, if I were to put my hand through the laser beam at the top... Okay, the, totally um, the sound is degrading yeah. even more as we go, so let's try to fix that and maybe show it at the end of the presentation. With this particular wind controller, I have to Can play we the cut the video? Sorry, Bob, we'll try to get the sound fixed up. It degraded, I guess, as we sent it through the system. I, I didn't mean to have the Martian sound, sound effect. <laughs> you guys don't fool around, you do the full package. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so we will, um, I will ask the panel a few questions um, mm -hmm. and I will let them speak to you and let you know their STEM story and we'll try to get the video cleaned up. All right, so I would like to ask Alyssa a very important question. It's important to me as a mother and as a teacher um, and it's important for you all to hear um, I know your father has been instrumental in your education, and he has supported you greatly with your mission, which is fabulous. And what would you say to parents? I know you know a lot of people. <laughs> what would you say to parents to help them um, encourage their students or support their children with whatever they want to pursue, especially STEM? Right, it's all about encouraging the kids to kind of pursue whatever dream they may have at the time. And even if they decide to change what they want to do with their life 20 times within the week, then let them keep changing it. And especially when kids are younger, you don't really know what exactly they're going to hook onto or what they're really going to want to do. Um, and so it's just letting them explore all the different options that are available to them. So even through each stage that they get, let them kind of encourage whatever it is, even if it's being a princess or being a pirate, just let them kind of experience that time of going through it and support them in whatever it might be. And then if it changes, then support them in their new dream. So it's just always offering that support to kind of push because you don't know if it could grow into something bigger. Thank you, great. Um, Jennifer, you have a different perspective, um, being the outreach person for Lockheed sure, Martin. Sure. What would you say to parents? I'm sure you've had experiences with parents and their children. Yep. Um, many different ones, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what would you recommend if you see something um, you wouldn't want a parent to necessarily do or something good that you've seen a parent do? Yeah, you know, and I, I'm a mom too, um, and you know, I think I exposure is the key. I mean, I think the more, you know, we as parents can, you know, expose our children to lots of different things. You know, I certainly know, you know, when my son was three, all he cared about was being a fireman. 
that was what he was obsessed with. And, you know, we certainly, that would have been great. But, you know, now that he's seven, he either wants to be an astronaut or a baseball player. So you can see that we've hopefully helped foster his interests, um, you know, in, in, you know, both, both math and science and, and certainly in sports. And I just think, you know, especially here in DC and, and hopefully where you all are from, I mean, there are just so many opportunities to go and to take your kids to, to not only, you know, museums and the like, but there's maker fairs. Um, you know, really STEM has fortunately become, you know, so pervasive and prevalent in our society that I think, you know, when I was growing up, you know, I wasn't exposed to as much, and so I, you know, was a liberal arts major. So who knows what would have happened if, you know, more of that exposure had been, um, you know, available to me. Um, that's what I just really think the key is, is to expose your kids to as much of their interests as possible, and then, you know, sometimes you have to push them a little to, to maybe think outside the box and expose them to things that, that they think they might not be interested in, but in reality, they may end up becoming so. Thank you. And Bob, can you tell us how um, your program, Kids Talk Radio, how many people it reaches, how it inspires people to get involved in STEM programs? Well, uh, all I can tell you is Google said to us, call us when you get a million listeners. <laughs> well, we have a half a million listeners and we, we can't call them. <laughs> so we're reaching out to about a half a million kids now across the world because we just received a beautiful video from kids in Russia. They kind of went online and saw what we were doing and they put together a video completely on their own and I got to see pictures of the Russian space program and I said, oh my God, I don't think the public has ever seen these pictures. And they came from a, 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 a te two teachers and a group of 10 kids in Russia. So we have Kids Talk Radio China, Kids Talk Radio Japan, Kids Talk Radio Africa, Italy, and on and on and on. And so uh, it just started off as a little grassroots thing. And uh, we opened it up to adults, so you could actually be on Kids Talk Radio. We would interview you from a distance, and you would say, we've got this cute thing that you know we think kids would be interested in. It has to do with Mars. And we'll interview you. There's no prejudice because you're not a kid. We're all kids if we're members of the Mars Society. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. Alyssa, I know you were very young when you decided you wanted to become an astronaut and to go to Mars. Can you tell us as you've grown up, um, you're 15, correct? Um, what are some of the milestones or aha moments you've experienced? Because I know it's different at three than 15, how you feel about things. Some, some things along the way, along your journey that have been like, yes, I definitely am going to do this. Right, so at three, the thing that got me started was a TV show, is actually The Backyardigans, and the little creatures were going on an imaginary trip to Mars, and you know, I just wanted to be like one of the little friends and go on the trip with them. And so that's what kind of first sparked it, but over the years, there's obviously been other things that kind of encouraged me even more to um, not only be more interested about space and about Mars, but just pers uh, kind of be more involved to pursue my dream. So one event was when I met astronaut Sandra Magnus, and I met her when I was nine years old. And I'm from Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and she was down in Louisiana at a Sally Ride Festival. And so I met her there, and she was telling me all about how she decided when she was nine years old that she was going to become an astronaut and ride the space shuttle. And of course, me being nine, I was like, oh my God, she decided when she was my age that she was going to become an astronaut. And so she kind of just looking up at her and seeing that she had been on the space shuttle multiple times and she was about to fly on the last space shuttle. It was just this really big moment showing me that you can decide what you want to do when you're young and eventually continue to pursue your dream and grow up and fulfill your dream. So it was one of those moments that really inspired me. And then also just, going to different places, seeing different things. Uh, I mean, when I was seven, going to space camp, that kind of taught me everything about space that I wanted to know. And I've been going ever since then. I've gone 15 times now to the one in Huntsville, Alabama, and still planning on going again. Um, 
And then also just everywhere I've gone, just kind of absorbing all the information, just kind of, it's kind of that interest that just kind of pulls you in and you're always wanting more. Wonderful, great, great information. Um, Jennifer, there are many schools that have decided suddenly in the past few years to start a STEM program. Um, some of them are better equipped than others, as you know. Um, what would you recommend? Because I've heard uh, teachers say, I'm a history teacher. How are we going to do a STEM program in my class? They think they have to build spaceships or something. Right. Um, <laughs> what would you say to all the teachers and administrators who want to start a STEM program, but they really aren't sure how to do it. Mm -hmm. How would you inform them? Yeah, I mean, fortunately, there's a lot of, um, you know, resources out there, both free and not free. Um, you know, one of our STEM partners that we work with is Project Lead the Way, and they're a um, in-school core curriculum uh, for K to 12, so they have a couple different pathways. Um, both in K-5 to and middle school, and then in high school, you can choose either engineering or computer science. And, and certainly, you know, concepts like space exploration and others are, are woven throughout that. But, you know, obviously, they, we see them as kind of the gold standard of, um, of STEM curriculum, and, and certainly not every school can, can afford that. Um, you know, certainly there are lots of uh, grant opportunities these days um, to, you know, because obviously everyone, the administration and and everyone is so focused on kind of closing this, this STEM gap that we have. But certainly other, you know, other providers, um, you know, to just kind of put your foot in the door. Um, you know, what we've done with Generation Beyond is it's free. It's supplemental. So any teacher can use the lesson plans provided. You don't have to be a science teacher or math teacher um, to do so. If, if you're a history teacher, I mean, what the curriculum does is, is talk about the importance of, of why is deep space exploration important and, and what, what is it going to take to get us there. And as you all know, there's more than just scientific concepts um, included in that. Um, and so that's what you know, I would really encourage is to you know, kind of seek out resources. I also think that you know, industries like ours are, are really interested in, in partnering with schools. Um, you know, we, have a you know a reason to do so as I said there's a there's a shortage of um, of STEM workers facing this country and so it's in our best interest to work with K12 K12 schools and help augment the skills that the teachers have um, you know we we get that you don't know teachers may not know all of the concepts that certainly industry does so so what can we do to help we we have a program called engineers in the classroom where we go into schools across the country and do you know hands-on stem projects and activities but also it's the it's the mentoring and the guiding um, you know we always say if you can't see it you can't be it I mean lots of kids um, are not as lucky to be exposed to you know all the wonderful things that Alyssa is. So it's, you know, it's our job um, to, to help um, with, with that exposure and really help our nation's teachers. Wonderful. Thank you. And Bob, um, just to continue on that same subject, you can't be in every school across the country at once, right? Right. <laughs> You're just one person. <laughs> So if you were to pop into a STEM school, what would you like to see? And if you didn't see what you think you should see in the STEM school, um, what would you recommend to that school? Well, what I'm noticing is that uh, this whole makers movement is really taking off. I've never seen so many robots being made on every, every corner, just about at this point. And uh, devices like the Arduino uh, boards and kits and all of these wonderful things that are happening, I, I would like to see uh, the makers movement move in because we pulled out the wood shop and the metal shops. So remember the wood shops and metal shops and, yes. and even the sewing class. Even, even yes. to, today, uh, there were things that uh, I needed a case for, for my iPhone. The, I got the extra big iPhone. And so what I did was I, I got a case like this. See, so my gigantic iPhone fits in the case. But they pulled out the sewing class, so no one makes cases like this. And I, you know, you see what I mean? So 
uh, it's nice to see that the shop classes may be making a comeback because of this whole makers movement. I was recently at the AIAA convention and a young, I went into a talk just like this and somebody's making Martian habitats with a 3D printer. It's getting exciting, folks. <laughs> Can you hear me? I purchased a 3D printer for my class and we did that very same thing last year. Um, it was a wonderful experience. Um, let's see, Alyssa, what would you say to a student your age that wasn't sure if he wanted to be a firefighter or an astronaut <laughs> and you're like, he really has the qualifications or she really has, she really has it together. Um, what would you recommend them, what their next step to be? Right, so I would tell any kid or even adults who are still trying to figure out what they're doing or what they may still want to do, just uh, like just looking at school and the school subjects that you're taking, just find the one that interests you the most because I mean, you take so many classes, you have to like at least one of them. Yes. So just find the one that you like the most and then from there you can go and look at different careers that go along with the subject because there's so many options. I mean, if you just take math, I mean, you can go from anywhere from like going into a STEM career, just being a math teacher or so you can, there's so many different options. So just exploring those options and then being exposed to the ones that you like the most and doing more research about it. And if it's really something that you find that you really want to do, then make a dream about it and then start doing whatever you can to pursue your dream and start asking around for people that are around you who can support you, start with families, friends, and then start finding people in your area that can assist you or uh, find people that maybe are in the career that can give you advice about what to do and just kind of work your way around and try to find any means possible to start pursuing your dream. And then once you find it, just never give up on your dream and never let anyone take your dreams away from you. Because if it's really something that you want to do with your life, you can find ways to go around the obstacles to pursue that dream. And so it's all about just fighting hard if it's really something that you want to do with your life. And what is your favorite subject? You're, you, you're in high school now? Yes, I'm in high school. Uh, I would probably say probably math and science, of course. Um, plus, they're probably my strongest. Like English, that's a really weak subject for me. So it's probably not my favorite. So since math and science is my strongest, it's probably also my favorite. OK, that's great. Um, and Jennifer, um, how is Lockheed Martin reaching out um, specifically? Do you have a certain school or group of schools that you have programs that you've implemented? Yeah, so what we do, um, and, and we certainly do this globally as well um, in, in certain countries, but in the United States, um, you know, we have some national partnerships with um, various STEM groups. I mentioned Project Lead the Way, so we fund, um, you know, many of their schools across the country. We actually did district-wide implementations of Project Lead the Way in a couple of different urban school districts because we really see the need not only to fill the STEM pipeline, but we really need to diversify the STEM pipeline. Um, and then we also work with groups like Girls Inc., again, going back to that diversification. Um, so working with um, their affiliates around the country and, and getting our primarily our female um, engineers and technologists into those um, after school programs. So again, girls, um, hopefully something will spark within them and they'll you know, get hooked like Alyssa has done. Um, but we work with lots of different um, nonprofit players. Um, and then like I said, I mean, we know there's, there's a school on every corner um, near every Lockheed Martin facility. So as much as we possibly can, we try to, again, do outreach to those schools, get our engineers in there, help them attend, you know, by attending career fairs, career fairs and STEM days and, um, you know, science fairs. And, and again, just, you know, that's our way of giving back. And obviously I will, as probably many of you who might have volunteered in classrooms, um, so much goodness is felt back. And, you know, I would say to a T, anyone who does it, it might be a little scary for the first time, um, speaking in front of a bunch of kids. But, you know, once our engineers do that, they're really hooked. So it's really a, a, a two-way um, opportunity for both us giving back and then engineers kind of taking something and bringing it back to their colleagues as well. Okay, thank you. And Bob, um, what 
would you say with your wide experience um, in, with different age groups is the difference between implementing um, STEM in young elementary school, elementary age children, middle and high school. What do you see as appropriate for the age, the different age levels? Well, you know, it, when you think about this, we have to start as early as possible because America is in 26th place in science. And so we have to start early and we have to come up with creative ways to go from K to 12. And so a, a lot of groups are really doing that. They're going in. Uh, if you have a chance to go online and you take a look at the next generation science standards, you will see that they really did a fantastic job in making it possible for America to really make a nice comeback in science. So uh, what, what we do is uh, we go from K to 12 and we send our teachers and engineers into the different classrooms and we try to get the, the message going early, uh, try to get involved in lots of hands-on projects. Uh, a, a beautiful example of, of a hands-on project that can go across the grade levels is this. The other day, we, we created a cricket detector because if there's a cricket in the room, everyone in this room would point to a different spot, say, it's over there, it's over there, it's over there. So we said, the heck with that, we got to get more scientific. So we created a cricket detector, and now we can find the cricket every time. So now, when we do things like that, we try to make the connection to Mars. What would be the connection to Mars if we have a cricket detector? Water detector. There you go. <laughs> and, and, and it starts like that. Kids Talk Radio helps to create a conversation. So if I have a right or wrong answer, someone's going to do what she just did. And then we keep moving on. Great. Alyssa, um, you've had a lot of teachers through your life. And can you give me an example or two or three, how many ever you have, of some of your favorite teachers? You don't have to say their names <laughs> unless you just want to. And the kind of projects that they may have done in the classroom or outside of the classroom that got you really excited about STEM. Well, I know for one, um, kind of in science class, you know, you always have some kind of space lesson or um, maybe it's about uh, forces, but they all kind of relate back to kind of more about STEM and space. And obviously those kind of always, when I was younger, always got me really excited because I knew I could do good in that class because I had learned um, more information about it. Um, actually once, a really good example, uh, my school, our science teacher had left, so my dad actually filled in the spot to become the science teacher. And so, Obviously, he's not an actual like science teacher, but he's certified in like specifically uh, like NASA history and things like that. And so we had a whole lesson just about space and space history and future space space exploration. And I absolutely nailed that class. It was everything. <laughs> <laughs> it was every, it was everything that I had been studying ever since I was little. So obviously, it was something that I was really interested in. And so I did very well. And also just throughout the years, I've had a bunch of teachers, like my math teacher, and actually my history teacher, even though it doesn't really have much to do with uh, space travel, but her, them specifically, they've been very helpful in supporting me and giving me advice and have how, how to kind of keep up my schoolwork and then at the same time doing everything else on the side that I do to kind of pursue my dream. And they've been very helpful kind of kind of working with me to get ahead on things and also just teaching me um, kind of things that advance I could need for things I'm doing outside of school. And so they've been kind of two major people that have been a major help at the school as well as the principal. She's been very kind of helpful in letting me do different things because it's for my education and something that is going to help me in the future. Great. And um, let's, I had another question, but it escaped me, but I'll get back to it. Um, <laughs> Jennifer. What is the best way, as a mother and an education outreach coordinator, um, to inspire the students, maybe your own children, or students you come in contact with, to um, go into a 
science, technology, engineering, or mathematics? What would you say as far as hands-on? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think, you know, I think we have to recognize that, you know, sometimes messages, um, you know, well, messages are, are very important. I mean, certainly, um, you know, to girls, um, you know, you hear a lot of, you know, well, I'm not good at math, or is, you know, if I were to say that to my daughter, um, I've programmed myself not to say that to my daughter because I think, you know, those those kind of messages click in. Um, so, you know, I think it's about on the on the converse side, what really works. I think for for girls, um, you know, maybe not in terms of space exploration, but in other STEM subjects, you know, especially in engineering. I mean, what really you know, permeates with, with a lot of girls is that, you know, this work, we're, we're changing the world. We're making the world a better place. And, and that sometimes is the spark that one needs and to sh demonstrate what, what are those projects and careers that, you know, are out there that um, can inspire a girl and, you know, help her change the world. And I, and I think, you know, certainly that message works for boys as well, but, you know, at, at the onset, sometimes it's the cool robots and, and the mm -hmm. tinkering and the like um, that, you know, kind of sparks their interest. So I think it's being mindful of that and certainly not to, you know, cut those things off from, from a girl or, or conversely not tell a boy that they can change the world. But I think it's about being cognizant of both. I also think that, you know, early on when kids are exposed to this stuff, they, they generally love it. I mean, you know, you see three-year-olds building with blocks. I mean, that's engineering right there. But I think there's, there's a tipping point almost, and, and we think it's, you know, really in middle school and, and eighth grade specifically when, you know, the subjects get harder, they may have to do algebra, and they kind of, that's the go, no-go point of, you know, am I going to continue, you know, taking those harder STEM subjects in high school, for instance. So I think, you know, any support that we can give those students who may, you know, have trouble grasping the concepts but are really interested in it, we can't just let those kids go. We have to find ways to, to help them, um, to provide tutors for them, because, you know, you don't want that one subject to be the reason that he or she didn't become an astronaut or study STEM. So I think, you know, providing that support, recognizing it early on, and, and again, helping our teachers. I mean, it sounds like Alyssa goes to an amazing school who's so supportive. We know that, unfortunately, not every school is like that, but, but again, just, just trying to, um, you know, help our teachers, help our administrators. Um, we all know they're, they're overloaded these days. Um, so again, that's where, you know, folks like us and, 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 and Bob can come in. Um, you know, to help them, um, you know, make sure that those kids who are really interested but just need that a little extra push aren't left behind. Okay, Alyssa, I remembered my question. <laughs> are there any memorable hands-on projects that you've been involved in, um, in some of your science or math classes or even outside at another community event? Right, so talking a little bit about like outside school class projects, but some different um, kind of programs in the local area. We have a program called GEM, so Girls Excited About Math and Science. And uh, kind of recently been working with them a little bit, and it's just all about going to different schools and the local Louisiana community, and they're starting to get a, almost, it's almost like a club in each school, getting a group of girls, and I think it's like fourth and fifth grade specifically, and showing them more about engineering and math and science to get them that little extra push of showing them uh, this is a little bit about math and science and finding those few girls who are super interested in it and then tell, getting them to tell their friends about how much fun they're having. And it's just a great program that's been kind of going around the local area. Um, but I mean, it's just that little bit that helps each person in the school. Uh, and so that's uh, one program. And then, you know, obviously there's others all over the place and all over the world that are trying to help. But it's just finding those little programs that can help and maybe it's just one little girl in the group, but finding those kids who really need the support to kind of pursue their interest in STEM. That's, that's, that's a great point about it just could be one person because sometimes I'm teaching to a class of 25 and their eyes are glazed over and they don't <laughs> care what I'm saying. <laughs> but one person, one student gets excited. Right. So yeah, you just have to get that one person. That's wonderful. Um, Bob, can you tell us, besides Kids Talk Radio, an example of, uh, since our video might be coming or not, <laughs> um, something hands-on that's very important to you that um, really gets students' attention? 
Well, I see there's a lady over there taking a picture, Barbara David. She taught me a lot about the space industry, but she gave me the thrill of my life. She called me up on the phone and she said, hey, Bob, can you get your little robot and do a special birthday greeting for Buzz Aldrin? <laughs> and, and so I said, oh, my God. This is the guy who was on the moon. And now I get to do a birthday greeting. So I took my little robot and we put together a special birthday greeting for Buzz Aldrin. And I think about the last time I had that connection was I was a soldier, a young soldier in Vietnam and I was on patrol. And everywhere I went, people were pointing up at the moon. Uh -huh. And we had no idea. We were on night patrol, and you know, you know how when you can see the moon in the daytime? Well, it was that special day in July where you could see the moon in the daytime. So that was my first connection with Buzz Aldrin, but the thrill was to get that little robot that you saw on that screen to do a birthday greeting for him. And I want to thank Barbara right there. <laughs> okay. That doesn't surprise me. I've also talked on the phone with Bob. A <laughs> couple of Mars nuts. <laughs> we're all Mars nuts. That's why we're here. Um, OK, so do any of you have anything you want to say to wrap up um, your comments in case of something that you forgot or something I didn't ask you about? Just a couple of minutes, and then we'll take questions. Uh, Alyssa? I'm good. OK. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Well, I just, again, had to, you know, just want to mention Generation Beyond. Again, all of the resources I mentioned, plus lots of others, are at generationbeyondinschool.com. Love for you all to t tune into our uh, field trip on October 4th. Um, I'm hoping you all would, would get a kick out of, you know, seeing kind of behind the scenes of our, of our Space Operations Simulation Center in Colorado. And, and Bob, before you speak, your, well, video, uh, your video's ready, so. Oh, the video's ready? Okay, yep. there is a God. If we, if we get the sound, I'm not gonna do that Martian sound anymore. <laughs> okay. If someone were to ask me, there is what a God. What would be your actual wish for the Long Beach Unified School District? One of the things that I would love is to work with every one of your science and math teachers as we work as a team to get our kids really, really excited about learning. Greetings, everyone. My name is Bob Barboza, and welcome to the Barboza Space Center. And welcome to the robotics department of the Barboza Space Center. This is one of the most exciting departments. I happen to have in front of me a humanoid robot. This is the robot that I'll take with me to the planet Mars. While I'm asleep, he'll run the spaceship. If I come up with any medical problems along the way, as long as I'm wearing my Apple Watch and I have my Apple phone in my pocket, this guy will actually capture my medical information and get me the help I need. But right now, good, I needed him to give me a little signal because I know he speaks 12 foreign languages and I will be speaking English today. And what I want to do is have him get up. Okay, Mr. Now, I'm glad you're looking for me because I'm right here. I've had a wonderful career in public education. I had a chance to teach for the Paramount Unified School District. And then I had the opportunity to go ahead and work on a special project called the XQ Super School Project. And that was a special program that was put together by Mrs. Jobs and her team. And we were basically asked to put together our own team to help rethink the American high school. Because we're prototyping all the time, 
kids get an opportunity to do and to use what we call STEAM++, science, technology, engineering, visual and performing arts, mathematics, computer languages, and foreign languages. We're going to work with people from different locations around the world. We're in the business of training junior astronauts, junior scientists, and junior engineers. Now, we take the, uh, visual and performing arts really seriously. And we have Kids Talk Radio Science for our students to do something special that we call STEM Stories. We're trying to train our students to play the music and sound effects behind a STEM story. Here's how it works. If I was a classical musician and I had to play the timpani, I would need a huge van to carry everything around. But if I have electronic timpani, I could represent the orchestra like this. In the beginning, we would call the All Teachers Occupy Mars Band because they were just teachers. But now we're going to add different wind controllers and we're going to add different laser instruments until we get a full orchestra. And our purpose is to play the music and sound effects behind STEM stories. So when you see all of these musical instruments, I want you to think of being in a physics class and all kinds of different devices that have to do with the physics of sound. Because I program these laser beams to be different instruments, if I were to put my hand through the laser beam at the top, I'll get a totally different instrument. With this particular wind controller, I have to play the part of an oboe player. So in the case of the assignment that I have for today, I'm playing the music and sound effects behind a STEM story, and I have a very specific part to rehearse. One is in a real bizarre time signature called 19-8. One two three, one two three, one two, one two, one two, one one two, one two, one two, one two three, one two three, one two, one two, one two, one two. When I go one one two, that's the pulse the entire band locks into. It's a tricky signature to play as a band. What would happen if I had ten of these and ten different students playing all at the same time? I would have a little miniature electronic orchestra. With a program like that, we get a chance to build prototypes and to tell the story about what we're doing on a special channel called Kids Talk Radio, and specifically, Kids Talk Radio Science. The Design Center is all about designing the future of education. When we were doing that, we kind of needed a theme the Occupy Mars Learning Adventure. Let's do something way out in the future. We knew we wanted to integrate the Common Core State Standards and the Next Generation Science Standards and kind of put it together in a nice little package of project-based learning. And what we'll do is we'll design something for teachers that love to teach. At the Super School Design Center, we thought we'd turn that into a nonprofit organization and its sole purpose would be to bring teachers, scientists, and engineers together to design projects. So we're going to simulate scientific experiments, and we're also going to simulate engineering prototypes. Some of the prototypes that we build are robots using 3D printers for the parts. In addition to that, we're building Mars rovers. And then we're building special little robots that help us conduct science experiments. We're also building satellites. So we have student-made satellite prototypes. And then what has me exceptionally excited are the nano satellites, those are little miniature guys that we try to get down almost to the size of a postage stamp. We're building Martian habitats. This is getting very interesting. 
especially when we apply our work to the study of geometry. It's one of the most exciting hands-on geometry programs that I've been involved with. And I'm one of the people working on the special space math program. So with these uh, habitats, we can call them Martian habitats, we can call them Earth habitats, but our planning and thinking is on Earth. Okay, in order to have time for questions from the audience, since we had a little issue with the video, um, if you'd like to stay after, we can finish uh, playing the video after 12. But let's take some questions from the audience for our panel members. And wait for the mic. The volunteers will bring you a mic. Uh, please state your name and state who, uh, which panelist you have a question for, please. Okay, I guess I guess I go first. Um, so I have a question for Alyssa. Uh, you're definitely the youngest person in this room, uh, but also the, probably one of the closest people in this room, if not the closest, to becoming an astronaut. Uh, and that's definitely not a normal, quote unquote, life that people would normally have. So what what do you say, and what do people say to you when they say, "Oh, I mean, this is an awesome life," but I'm sure some people don't think so. So what do you say to your the people your age who look at you and you know, and, and, and think that you have a, you know, either an awesome or, you know, maybe difficult, you know, uh, life, so to speak. I mean, of course, you know, some people think I'm crazy, but I mean, that's okay. <laughs> um, and especially for like other kids uh, my age, I mean, obviously there's other kids who have the same interests and there's other kids who are looking or kind of have the idea of wanting to become an astronaut. And then there's other kids who have other ideas about what they want to do. And I think just, I would say, um, as far as people who kind of don't, aren't kind of really involved in kind of the whole Mars mission, um, they don't really see the importance of it or benefits that um, someone who is involved in it would see. And I mean, aside from that, it's all about, if they are that way, then teaching them about it and kind of delivering that information to them. So then they are kind of informed about what's going on. And then uh, as far as, um, you know, someone who is interested in it, they know some, kind of giving them more information. So for me, it's just all about kind of informing the next generation of kids because they're kind of the Mars generation, the generation of kids who are going to be either part of the Mars mission or um, alive to witness it or maybe be working on it or maybe be on the trip to Mars. So uh, they're kind of going to be part of it. So kind of letting everyone know what's going on and that humans are going to Mars. Great. Next question. Wait for the mic, please. I, I also, hello. I'd also like to address Alyssa. And I, uh, I had five children. My three boys all went technical, but I failed with my two daughters. Not, not that they would be failures, but they're doing other things. And uh, I now am working on my three granddaughters. <laughs> and they're, they're 16, 15, and 3. And I was curious of the space camp patch you have on. You, you went to the space camp. Do you think that made a difference in as a child to motivate you down the technical path? Well, so I know that um, space camp and Ounce Alabama, they've been a huge support for me. And uh, also going there, I learned so much while having so much fun in just six days. And so it was a great way to learn more about space and space history and what it can do for you, as well as having a bunch of fun by riding different simulators or um, uh, one of them just like experiencing moon gravity. So it's like one sixth gravity. So when you jump in the air, you know, you feel a little bit like Superman. So like doing things like that, just feeling uh, and seeing kind of, kind of what it's all about, I think it was a great kind of motivation for me and kind of showed me more about it or more about space in general. Okay, thank you. Um, let's see, next question, gentleman in the hat. Well, I apologize to the other panelists, but I- We can't, to... we can't hear you. Wait, try it again. Clo Testing, okay, Go. Let's, let's put it closer. Alyssa, I apologize to the other panelists, but I'm gonna drill you with another question. <laughs> so, um, and like you, I wrote it down too. Like you, when I was young, living in Houston, Texas, I dreamed of going to Mars and being the first to step foot on Mars. But alas, I'm 64 years old, desiccated if not dried up, and it's too late for me. 
So, but if I were your age, I would want a teacher who would not only educate me in the STEM fields and disciplines, but also in health to get me ready to go to Mars with things like nutrition, exercise, mindfulness. Do you have such a teacher, or would you like to have such a teacher? You know, if the others would like to say if they know such a teacher, please respond. I mean, I know like right now, um, for my Louisiana high school diploma, I have to have one credit of health class. So I do have to do have to take that. And so I think, actually, I don't know what I'm taking. It's some time on my high school play, maybe next year, maybe this year, I'm not sure. So I do know that I'm exposed to that as part of just our usual state uh, high school curriculum. And then aside from doing that, it's since it's something that I'm interested in, I know that's aspects of the mission. So um, just finding different people who can help me or teach me more about the subject outside, because I know it's something that I will have to learn if I want to fulfill my dream. So kind of finding people around me who could help me in the subject. Um, for example, at like next week when I go to Possum, maybe they would teach me more about that subject as far as exercising and nutrition in space. OK. The if the panel doesn't mind a couple more questions, if you don't mind waiting, um, we will take a couple more questions. Hello. Um, so I guess this is really for the panel at large. Um, so I studied, um, I, studied, oh, I studied physics, and um, basically a lot of my peers came in being inspired by such people like Brian Cox, Michio Kaku, Neil deGrasse Tyson, and they all talk about more of the um, you know, the sexy side of physics, you know, Large Hadron Collider, the theory of everything, and such like. Um, then, but sometimes people sort of unfortunately fall by the wayside when they show up in class on day one and they're met with inclined planes and all this math and they say, oh, I didn't sign up for this. How do you, do you have any ideas on how to keep the work exciting but also kind of grounded in realism? Because um, what they don't tell you is that most physicists work on the sort of less sexy side of, like, say, materials, even though there's lots of interesting things like graphing and such. Like, how do you, again, I guess, just really keep it yeah. grounded in the realism of the day to day grind, but also keep it exciting? Yeah, could I take a crack at that? Mm -hmm. What we did uh, in California is we combined the Columbia Memorial Space Center with the Barboza Space Center. So I did all the things that were robot related and scientific experiment related, but the Columbia Memorial Space Center, they actually built uh, mission control. And so we would take a student like you in that system and we would apply your physics to the projects so everything would be project-based learning with the sole purpose of keeping you excited about this whole situation. Our traditional schools go from chapter to chapter to chapter to chapter no matter what. Mm -hmm. But with the next generation science standards, we're taking a different approach so we don't lose someone like you. And we keep you fired up because we have two models. NASA needs your help and NOAA needs your help. Okay, thank you, and I've been given the signal that time is up. Um, I'm sure the panelists wouldn't mind sticking around um, in the back of the room or in the hallway and answering your questions further. Thank you for being patient, and um, I appreciate you all being here. Have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you.